Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to our service this evening. <clears throat> well, thanks for making the effort to come along. Hopefully, we'll all get home at the end of it as well. Um, don't think there's anything much I need to highlight off the bulletin. It's all pretty much uh, standard. So the free lunch resumes tomorrow, midday, uh, Wednesday. It's third Wednesday of the month, so we've got the congregational prayer meeting. So the ten folk will be through here for that. Um, one thing not on here, Friday, um, the Tain Lunch Club. So the Lunch in Tain has now resumed weekly. So that's on every Friday from midday, again, club out, half past one. Uh, and that's open to anybody, all ages. Um, Overleaf, I just committed to you. It's pretty much the same as last week. Just have a read of that uh, yourselves. We're here to worship God. We're going to sing to his praise from Psalm 148 and the Scottish Psalter. So it's on page 449. <clears throat> page 449, second version of Psalm 148. And we're going to sing the whole of that psalm uh, together. Lord of heaven, confess on high his glory raise. Him let all angels bless. Him all his armies praise. Him glorify sun, moon, and stars. Ye higher spheres and cloudy sky. Psalm 148, let's stand and sing praise to God, the whole of this psalm. as we call on God's name in prayer. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, you are the one who is to be praised, the Lord of heaven and earth. And that is the message of this psalm, that everyone should praise you, both high and low, both rich and poor, both young and old. You are the maker of us all, Lord. And therefore, we all owe you our worship and you, Lord, you're the God of heaven, but you're also the God of the earth. You're the one who upholds all things in the heavens and here on earth. You're the one who 
controls the beat of our heart and the breath in our lungs. It's under your command. So help us, Lord. Help us to to worship your right, to have a right attitude towards you, knowing that you're the one who, who made us, the one who appointed the day of our birth and the one who knows the day of our death. So, Lord, draw near to us and help us to draw near to you with an appropriate spirit this evening. We thank you, Lord, that despite all the power that you wield, you are not a dictator. You, you treat us kindly, you treat us lovingly, you treat us generously. We thank you for that. You gave us the greatest gift that anyone could be given. You gave us your son to be the savior of all who would put their trust in him. And you gave him, Lord, knowing that that we would likely reject him, as most of us did for much of our lives. We praise you, Lord, that you do not give up on us despite our rebellious streak. Instead, you continue to reach out for us. And you will be doing that even this evening as we meet together, appealing to us, drawing us, Lord, to yourself. And we pray, Lord, that as the good news of salvation, free and full salvation through Jesus Christ is preached this day all over the world, Lord, that it would bear fruit for your glory, that men and women, boys and girls would be convinced of their need of a Savior and would understand, Lord, that Jesus is the one whom you sent to seek and to save those that are lost. We thank you, Lord, for everyone who can say this evening that they know Jesus as their personal Savior. We pray for those, Lord, who cannot yet say that, uh, that you would put within them a longing and a desire to seek him with all their hearts, Lord. And we pray for those around us. We pray for the homes that are in darkness, that have no word this evening of the fact that it's Sunday, that it's the Lord's day, of no desire, Lord, to gather with your people in worship, no understanding of their own need or the peril that they are in. Lord, we pray, knowing that you alone can persuade, we pray for a work of your Holy Spirit in our congregation and in our community to alert us, Lord, to our need and to draw us to Jesus Christ. So help us, Lord, help all who stand in particular need of you. Uh, We pray, Lord, for those who are struggling with different things in their lives, those battling ill health, Lord, or deteriorating health. We pray that you will be close to such and you would bring healing, Lord, where that accords with your will. We we remember too, Lord, those who grieve connected with us as a congregation and and throughout our community, Lord. Uh, We pray that you would bring comfort Uh, to those who are hurting, those who've lost one who was uh, loved by them. Uh, We pray, Lord, for those who may have struggles in their home, their marriages, in their workplace, in their neighborhood, Uh, whatever it may be, Lord, help us to learn to bring all these things to you. Uh, All our anxieties, all our concerns, all our burdens, you call us, Lord, to come to you with them. So we pray that we will be able to do that, that we will be able to hand them over to you, Lord, and trust that you will help us. Sometimes we want these challenging situations to be taken away, and yet that's not often, not always what happens. But instead, you say to us, as you said eh, to the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So help us, Lord, to know your strength, helping us when we feel that we cannot cope with some of the situations that we meet with in life. As we pray for our congregation, we pray for our presbytery as well. Uh, We commit to the north to you, Lord. We pray for our first meeting of this year on Tuesday. We ask that you would be among us. We pray that you would help us, Lord, with all the challenges that we face. And we pray that this year, 2024, would be a year uh, where we would uh, see our presbytery being blessed and flourishing, Lord, and uh, growth in, in congregations and in people within it. And we pray, Lord, in connection with that, that you would send uh, workers into your harvest field because the need is great, Lord, and you are the, 
the Lord of the harvest. So we commit that situation to you. We pray for our denomination. We realize, Lord, that there are several men who, who will be due to retire this year. And, and we have many vacancies. And we have uh, a need for more workers, Lord, as we want to reach out into areas where there's little gospel witness and, and plant churches in these places. We pray, Lord, that you would help us with all of these things. We pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, people to serve you, who would be called by you, who would be equipped by you, and who would be helped by you in this service. So be with us this evening, Lord. We thank you for every individual that is here. And we ask that you would speak to us this evening as we read the Bible together and as we consider it for a time. Help us as we sing your praise to give us hearts, Lord, that overflow with thanksgiving that we, we would long to and love to lift our voices, Lord, in praise of you. So go before us, we pray. Cleanse us from our sin. Forgive us, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing now from Psalm 119 <clears throat> on page 407. It's a Scottish Psalter version. Psalm 119, and at verse 89, singing that section, from 89 to 96, Psalm 119, at verse 89, thy word forever is, O Lord, in heaven settled fast unto all generations, thy faithfulness doth last. This part of Psalm 119 will stand to sing praise to God. Yeah. 
Let's read God's Word now from uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, known as the love passage. It's not going to be our subject this evening. I'm not preaching from this passage. I'm going to preach from somewhere else uh, on the subject of hurry or eliminating hurry from our lives. But I want to read this passage about love. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 13. And I'm on page 1153 if you're using a church Bible. Let's hear God's word. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, And if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. This is the word of God, and we trust and we pray that he'll follow it with his blessing. I'm going to sing now from Psalm 139, Sing Psalms, page 181. Page 181, Psalm 139a, and we're singing from verse 13 down to verse 18, verses that remind us of God's knowledge of us, complete knowledge of us. Psalm 139a, verse 13. For you, O Lord, created me. You wove me on your loom. My inmost being you have formed within my mother's womb. Because I'm wonderfully made, with awe your praise I'll tell. Your workmanship is marvelous, and this I know full well. We're going to sing from verse 13 down to verse 18 of this psalm, Psalm 139a, to God's praise.
We turn down our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke and chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And I want to read some verses just at the end of that chapter. So I'm on page 1042. Page 1042. Read that last section from verse 38 at the home of Martha and Mary. So Luke chapter 10, taking up a reading at verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her particularly verse 40, the opening words of verse 40, but Martha was distracted. Sometimes someone gives you a book and you realize that there's a reason that they gave you that particular book. So the last book I was reading was called Saving Eutychus, How to Preach God's Word and Keep People Awake. And uh, thankfully, nobody gave me the book. I actually chose that one myself. But the book I'm currently reading was given to me, and I have no doubt it was given to me for good reason. It is called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I think many of us might benefit from it, but I know certainly that is an issue in my own life. Most of us, many of us at least, we're, we're too often in a hurry. We have too much work to do and too little time to do it. But is that how God wants us to operate? Martha was in a hurry here. Verse 40 tells us she was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. That may well be the story of your life tonight. We are distracted by lots of things, often necessary things, and people, people that need our help, that need our attention. But it would seem that being that busy, and particularly being distracted, is not how the Lord would have us be. And the message of the book I was reading, it was written by a fellow called John Mark Comer, best known as John Mark, that's how people refer to him, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. The message of that book is that hurry is not from God. It's not from God. Corrie ten Boom once wrote this, if the devil can't make you sin, he will make you busy. If he can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. And the reason for that is that busyness means that we often don't have the time for God that we ought to have. Busyness means that we don't hear his voice like we need to be hearing his voice. Martha's busyness kept her from listening to Jesus. Now, I'm not out to knock Martha tonight. I think many of you have a soft spot for her. I think I do as well, myself as well. And there's just a few weeks since Donnie McLeod, if you can remember, he preached an excellent sermon on this very passage, Mary and Martha. So tonight I'm just using this event and these verses as a kind of as a starting point to explore the theme of busyness and hurry and distraction. So I have three things I want to talk about. First of all, the epidemic of hurry. The epidemic of hurry. And then secondly, the impact of hurry. And then thirdly, the solution to hurry. So I'm not going to expound this passage. I'm more preaching on a theme 
than a passage this evening. I'd prefer to preach on a passage where everything we're going to talk about is there before us, but I will make reference to other scriptures uh, this evening because this is a theme that the Lord has laid on my heart this week. So we're going to start with the epidemic of hurry. I don't think you would argue with this fact that we, we live in an age that is in a rush, in a rush. Whenever you meet someone and you ask them how they're doing, they might say, yeah, I'm doing okay, just, just busy. Busy always, often finds its way into our answer. Our diaries are full. The pace of our lives is often frantic. We, we live in a generation that is stressed and depressed. And too often as Christians, we find ourselves in the same boat. Now, don't get me wrong. We are made to work. We ought to work. Right back in Genesis 3, God said to Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread. The New Testament is even clearer on that fact that we, we, we are to work in order to survive. Second Thessalonians 3, if a man will not work, he should not eat. And that's pretty clear. You should, you should work in order to, to survive. So we're, we're meant to work. We're made to work if our health allows it. And we human beings, we're made in God's image. So that means we have the potential. We have the potential to do great things, to do great works. But the problem is we're not like God in that God has no limitations. We do. We have limitations. We are made from the dust of the earth and to dust we will return. John Mark in his book says we are the uh, original biodegradable containers. We're going back to the dust. We have our limitations. God, the one who keeps this here, he, he, he slumbers not nor sleeps. He doesn't need sleep. You and I do. We have our limitations. We must sleep. The problem is, though, that the busier our lives are, the less we sleep. And the less we sleep, the less effective we are at working. So why is it that we sleep so much less than our forefathers did? Well, part of the reason for that is that we have far more distractions to keep us awake. So when your great, great, great grandfather got tired, he went to bed. Um, when you get tired... You think, I need to go to bed. But I, I better watch the news before I go in case I'm out of touch. Or you think, I really want to watch this series on the post office that everybody's talking about so that I'm not out of touch. Or if you're of a different generation, I, I want to catch that next program in the Netflix series that everybody's talking about at work so that I'm not out of touch. And if it's not the telly that keeps you awake, then we have the internet, we have social media, we have all these things that can rob you of hours that you could be sleeping. And when we do scroll social media, it's seldom leaves you feeling better. It often leaves a person feeling inadequate because you see everybody else posting all the places they've been and all the things they've done and the groups they took their kids to. And so you resolve, well, I better enroll my kids in that group, in that club, giving you hours of ferrying them back and forth here and there. That's just, that's the age we live in. And you'll never keep up with everybody else. But social media makes us feel we ought to. And when you feel like that, you'll, you're never going to feel satisfied. There are always going to be something else that you want to do. Now, much of that might not apply to you tonight. But I suspect 
that we're all familiar with the increased pace of life that leaves us too often, not always, maybe, but too often in a hurry and stressed. And that, that, that's not just occasional days. That becomes a way of life. Every day is like that. Every day. Well, this is not something that a, a spa day or some essential oils can fix. It needs something more radical, something more drastic than that. Of course, it's very possible that it's, that it's legitimate pursuits that fill our days, that we're doing good all of the time, that we're not actually wasting time. Think of Martha. Think of what she was doing. Martha was distracted by all the preparations that needed to be made. She had opened her home to Jesus and to his disciples. She was making a meal for them. How, what better use of your time could there be? And yet the Bible describes her as being distracted. Being distracted is not good for us, and it's not good for those around us either. We can become immersed in ourselves, in our screens, in our to-do lists, so that even when you're in company, you're distracted. You're thinking about the next thing you've got to do, or the next person you're going to see, or, or what's that ping on my phone just now? A Microsoft researcher said this, continuous partial attention is the new normal. Continuous partial attention is the new normal. So that is, in other words, we don't give anybody all our attention. We're partially distracted all of the time. And surely that's not how you or I want to operate. Surely that's not how we want to be as Christians. We want to give people our full attention. My a colleague and a fellow student when we were at uh, in Free Church College, as it was called back then, ETS, Hugh Ferrier, a lot younger than I am, but Hugh Ferrier, um, after he went to Stornoway, he was uh, speaking at a fellowship, and he was asked who his hero was. And he said his hero was Murdy Dunvegan. Now, if you don't know Murdy Dunvegan, he was a minister in Skye. Um, Murdo MacLeod actually passed away a week today. And Murdy Dunvegan was well known for having no real concept of time, in a good way, in a good way. And Hugh Ferrier said this. He said, I look up to him because, he said, I run into the co-op to get my messages and I just want to get my stuff and get out of there and get on with everything else I need to do. And he says, inevitably, Murdy's there talking to someone about the Lord without any hurry or pressure to go anywhere. He always made time for people. And the same ought to be true of us because that's what Jesus did. He made time for people. He stopped with people. He listened to people. He talked to people. But in order to do that, things probably have to change in my life and in your life. So that's our first point this evening, the epidemic of hurry. But then secondly, I want to talk about the impact of hurry. I mentioned that it impacts our relationships, but primarily it impacts our relationship with the Lord. You see, if we're always in a hurry, if there's always other things that need to be seen to, it's, it becomes difficult to shut these things out of your mind in order to have a quiet time with God. Or if we're tired because we're overworking, it is difficult to have quality time with the Lord. Now, sometimes Christians will say, I don't sense the presence of God as I once used to sense him. Well, it's true there can be periods in our lives when that is true. 
There can be times in our lives when, we, when we're not as aware of the Lord being with us as we once were. But it can also be the case that it's not the Lord that is absent, but us. Because we get sucked into our phones and our tellies and our pastimes and, and our entertainment and become oblivious to the God who is all around us. And he is all around us. We need to learn to switch off the noise, lay aside our gadgets, get away from the distractions in order to hear from God. Now, I, I think it's great that you can have the Bible on an app on your phone and you can, you can read it anywhere, anytime, with anybody. But when we have our own time with God, I would recommend that you're not reading your Bible off your phone. Because if you're reading your Bible off your phone, you're going to see all these notifications coming up that are going to distract you all the time. And even if you have a physical Bible in your hand, leave your phone in another room. Because when you hear it ping, and when you see the screen light up, every time that will distract you from your time with God. And we need to invest time in our relationship with God. In fact, every relationship, every relationship requires an investment of time for it to flourish. Love cannot be hurried. And that's why I read from 1 Corinthians 13. Can you tell me what the first description of love that Paul gave in that passage? Love is patient. Love is patient. And hurry and patience don't go together. And if love is patient, then hur hurry and, and love don't go together. And I think if you review your day and review your week, that you know that it's when we're in a hurry and when we're stressed that we are least loving to those around us. It's when you're in a hurry that you can be short with your spouse. You can be grumpy with your children. You can snap at your friends. Hurry prevents us giving the time that we ought to those that we love. So during this, uh, this week, I was away from home. I went to Lewis to see my mum. And uh, one evening I'd called my wife. We had chatted for a while and then I said, well, I, I need to go and finish my book now. And it was only when I picked up my book, having come off the phone, I realized that I was in a hurry to read my book that's about eliminating hurry from my life. When we're in a hurry, it impacts our relationships on the time that we give to people that we care for. And if hurry affects our human relationships, how much more? our relationship with God. Because whenever there's pressure on your time, something has to give. Something gets squeezed. We spend less time on something. And very often, what gets squeezed will be our time with the Lord. That's what happened to Martha. That's what this passage is all about. While her sister and the disciples sat with Jesus, she didn't have time. Martha, Martha, Jesus said, you are worried and upset about Many things. We need to slow down in order to appreciate the Lord. Otherwise, hurry will cause you to settle for a mediocre Christian experience, which is not what the Lord designed for you. Remember the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. That can't be done in a hurry. Love is patient. So when we're hurried, then our relationship with the Lord is not what it ought. The impact of hurry. We talked about the epidemic of hurry. We've considered there the impact of hurry. I want to uh, thirdly look at the solution to hurry. And, and at its simplest, it's to prioritize time 
with Jesus. We see here that that's what Jesus says to Martha. He says, only one thing is needed. Verse 42, is it? Only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. What did Mary choose? She chose to spend time with Jesus. And that's what Jesus calls us all to do. He calls us to come with our burdens, to bring them to him. And he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so he's saying, I I don't want you to be weighed down. I want you to bring your burden and your weariness to me. And I want to carry it with you. Because that's what a yoke is all about. The yoke was used, it was just a, an implement a, a, to, 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 that was used when two beasts were plowing, whether two oxen or whatever it was, so that they, 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 they shared the load. That's what the yoke was for. And so whatever load may be weighing you down this evening, you need to know that Jesus, Jesus wants to make it easier. And so Jesus invites us to come to him and to walk in step with him so that he will share that burden, so that he will carry it with you. But I'll remember this as well, though. Coming to Jesus and, and, and walking with him, that doesn't mean you don't work. We're made to work. Go back to the start. God means us to work. We're not just to become some spiritual nomad. Quite the opposite. The time we spend with Jesus equips us to work and to work better. He equips us to serve him. And, and he has work for us to do. Ephesians 2 verse 10 talks about good works which God has prepared in advance for you to do. So he's got stuff for you to do. You've got loads of stuff to do yourself. But is it God's stuff? Is it what he wants you to be doing? Are you wasting your time on stuff that God doesn't want you to be doing? And me with you. When we spend time with Jesus, we begin to realize and understand and learn what are these works that God has prepared for us to do. And it probably doesn't mean that you're to go off on mission to Africa or South America. It may simply be whatever stage you're at, in your life, whether it's looking after young children, they're a gift from the Lord, and there's a time in our lives when that is what he calls us to do, whether it's caring for a spouse who may be unwell, whether it's looking after a parent in advancing years, there are different stages in our lives different pressures in our lives. It may be you're setting up a business, that's going to take your time. Maybe you're finishing a degree, that's going to take your time. But whatever pressures we face, however busy we get, we must ensure we spend time with the Lord. Because when we don't, we can easily get our priorities wrong. I'm sure we do get our priorities wrong. We get sucked into the tyranny of the urgent rather than the important. Our lives become reactive rather than proactive. Walking in step with God, spending time with Jesus, it will help to ground you in what is important and guard you from what is unimportant. Remember what Jesus said? He said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for me, life to the full. And life to the full is not a life distracted by hurry, but a life devoted to him. Big question is, how do you achieve that? How do you achieve that? Well, I'm only halfway through the book. And maybe I'll come back and preach on this another evening. I, I, I'm not promising it because the next few weeks there's different things going on. We have baptism and communion. And, um, but I might come back. 
But the gist of it is this. How, how do we get out of the rut of doing the same old stuff again and again, expecting a different result, and we don't get it? Well, John Mark's answer in the book is this. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you must adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. You must adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. What does that mean? What is a lifestyle? Well, by lifestyle is meant the, the rhythms and routines that make up our day. It's a call to live like Jesus lived. And is that not what Jesus was calling us to? Is that not what Jesus is calling the weary and the burdened to when he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. When he was saying, take my yoke upon you, he's saying, walk with me. Mimic me. Be in step with me. Oh, you see, that sounds like more work. That's, that's the last thing I need. But Jesus isn't calling us to a greater workload. He's calling us to a shared workload. A shared workload. He's inviting you to walk with him as he shares your burdens. And if we're able to learn to do that, then the hurry will subside, the burden will ease, the anxieties will dissipate. Because what Jesus promises, he will always fulfill. And his promise is, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Amen. Lord, help us to respond to the invitation of Jesus. who tells us to come when we're wearied and when we're burdened. And to take his yoke. To walk in step with him. To learn from him. Help us, Lord. To do so, we pray. Help us to recognize where our priorities are out of sync with yours. Help us, Lord, to realize when other less important things are, are taking over our days and our time. And when we're not in fellowship with you and in relationship with you as we ought to be. Help us to remember that love is patient. And help us, Lord, to be prepared to spend time in the quiet, listening to you, reading your word, praying to you. Lord, change us, we pray. And whatever this year holds for us, we pray that it will be a time, Lord, when we are drawn closer to you and when we begin to walk in step with you. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to finish uh, singing in Psalm 90 in the Scottish Psalter. You'll find it on page 350. Page 350. Psalm 90, and at verse 10, I'm going to sing to the end of the double verse, Mark 12, so that's four stanzas. At verse 10, three score and ten years do sum up our days and years we see, or if by reason of more strength in some four score they be, yet doth the strength of such old men but grief and labor prove, for it is soon cut off, and we fly hence, and soon Remove. We're singing Psalm 90 from verse 10 to the end of the double verse, Mark 12, to God's praise.
and peace from God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.